So without further ado tonight, I'm gonna to turn it over to John Hare, our president, and John's going to introduce the program to you. John. Hey, thanks, Suzanne. Hello, everybody. Great to see some of you haven't seen for a while. And welcome to the Battle of Homestead Foundation's 2022 program series. Tonight, we'll again dig deep in the fertile soil of American social and industrial history. And we'll talk a lot about the present and future for a region we know well, the Mon Valley or Steel Valley of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll examine the long and torturous push and pull between big industry and environmental justice in our own backyard. And contrary to the current accolades for the boosting of hydrogen fuel carbon capture as an answer to climate disaster, our expert guests will challenge all policymakers with a very realistic plan that cuts fossil fuel production. Tonight's program is entitled a new vision for the Mon Valley, alternatives to plastics and hydrogen hubs. And we're thrilled to have two eminent scholars, writers and environmental activists as our guides tonight. Dr. Patricia DeMarco and Dr. Matt Mahalik. You've read their brief biographies in the event publicity and you've likely heard them in the news. But unfortunately, the established corporate dominated policy planners and their media too often muzzle their message, which is simple and direct. We can have clean jobs and clean energy in the Mon Valley, but not without the democratic participation in that process by the affected people in our communities, the workers and the residents. Dr. Matt Mahalik, director of the Breathe Collaborative, will first discuss five decades of the rise and decline of steel and energy production in the Steel Valley and the concomitant facts that our communities remain among the worst in family income, air pollution and public health in the nation. He'll also relate how corporate promises and prior agreements have remained unfulfilled. He'll then introduce and invite Dr. DeMarco to discuss the imperatives and the strategy to secure clean jobs and a sustainable economy. Following the discussion of our guests, there will be a brief question and answer period. Everyone, please write out your questions to the speakers and post them in the chat, as Suzanne directed. Let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Our founders were inspired by a dramatic labor conflict, the 1892 Battle of Homestead. The nation's eyes back then were on this thriving industrial town 12 miles downriver from Pittsburgh. The strong union, the amalgamated, had built powerful alliances within their workforce, the community and their region. They knew they had to defend their labor contract and its first rate compensation and work standards. Their employer, the Carnegie Steel Company, who had prior signed a contract with them, uh, as we know, a monopoly steel coal empire controlled by Andrew Carnegie and his henchman, Henry Clay Frick, was determined to cut wages and break the union. When the contract expired, Frick built a 12 foot high wall around the mill, locked out the workers and launched plans to import scab labor. The union then called a strike, an epic struggle ensued, which despite extraordinarily re extraordinary resistance and militants by the workers and their allies ultimately resulted in defeat for the union. That's because 8,000 state militia were sent in by the governor to occupy the mill to protect and permit scab labor. There are many sub stories and revelations within this epic, far too many to relate tonight. The more we dig deeper and learn, we discover and celebrate the seeds of hope in that resilient worker and community struggle. What are seeds of hope? A story or discovery that another world is possible. The mission of Battle Homestead is to grow these seeds by promoting a people's history, but also we work to empower today's workforce and build strategies for a future that benefits all working families in our nation. Our goal is to develop a regional center and institute for labor history and the future of work. 
we've been hampered by the COVID pandemic and we've done our best to communicate uh, in a safe way uh, online. And actually we've discovered new opportunities to reach out, educate, fundraise and organize. Uh, today, those seeds of hope that we've discussed still sprout anew, even as our country faces major social, economic and political crisis. Uh, the climate crisis being the most deadly of all of them. Um, but crisis can also mean opportunity. Uh, since November 3rd, 2020, we can begin to see the light. We take heart and recognize the tremendous organizing by grassroots groups, grassroots groups throughout the nation. Many women led, often in coalitions with organized labor. This heroic effort was the engine that expanded the electorate, giving voice to millions of average working people. Thus was propelled the election defeat of a mendacious anti-democratic president and his morally bankrupt enablers. But, the, but this hard one, one progress is by no means assured to continue. Tonight, we again celebrate creative grassroots workplace organizing, alliance building, and people's history. We're optimistic about our mission as we see the growth of power for working men and women in their communities. So we say, come join us. More about our exciting upcoming programs in the wrap up tonight. Now I'm delighted to give the mic to Matt and Patty, first Matt, both of whom grew up and love our region. You can follow them on links you'll see tonight in the chat. Welcome, Matt. You're up. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it. And with that introduction and the history that you set, it really is amazing how much history resonates into the present. And I think we'll unpack some of that this evening uh, in our discussion. I, I have some brief introduction um, slides to help set the stage. And then uh, Patty and I are gonna pivot to dialogue. So we wanna make sure we have robust dialogue this evening. For people who don't know me, I'm Matt Mihalik, I'm the director of the Breathe Project. We're an air quality advocacy organization. Um, and my um, evening wouldn't um, be complete unless I conveyed the latest status of our air quality uh, in spite of messaging that you might hear from our county health department. We still have a serious air quality problem and adding to it is gonna make things worse. Right now, if you average all monitors in Allegheny County, that average puts us at the 27th percentile compared with some other cities shows you how far we need to go. But if you look at the monitors that exist throughout our county, you see there's a lot that are clustered in the dirtiest monitors in the entire country. And the one that's in the Mon Valley, the Liberty Claritin monitor, and the one that's in Braddock are the two that are on the most left in the top 10 worst monitors for air quality in the country. So the Mon Valley still continues to be burdened by legacy pollution that exists. And none of our monitors would pass the World Health Organization standards. And only one, the cleanest one in our county, would be what our advocacy groups are calling for, for new standards for air quality. And our counties in the worst 1% of counties nationwide for cancer risk from point source air pollution. Okay, so that's setting the stage. Now I wanna show you a couple of images from when I was younger to what things are like now. This is my elementary school in Forest Hills where I grew up. My whole family worked in the Mon Valley and that school is gone over the course of my lifetime. Then this is the church that my grandparents and my mother went to and I did when I was a child. This is at the corner, was at the corner of 6th Street and Braddock, and, and Talbot Avenue in Braddock. And that's what it looks like today. And of course, at the bottom of the street where I grew up was the Westinghouse R&D lab, and that is gone. And of course, you all know what this is. So we've all experienced a lot of trauma over the years because of the way our valley has been run and the way it was set up. And we're still trying to heal from that and move forward. And so a lot of my work prior to moving back to Pittsburgh, because I moved away 
was trying to figure out what could be done. And I did some studies at the University of Virginia and published some papers about how to change manufacturing so that it wouldn't be polluting, that it could take low commodity based industries and have them go up market so that they can make a price premium on their products and sell them. And this is some of the very first green products that have been made. And my contribution was in looking at how the networks of people who make this happen come together so that these things can be built and, and made. And my moving back to Pittsburgh has been all about trying to help catalyze, align with, and support these networks. This was in a book that I co-authored and published in the year 2000 about all this information. And for 20 years, I've been trying to push this forward. I know Patty's been doing this even longer than I have. So I'm honored in one of the reasons why I think I'm back in Pittsburgh is because she and the work that she's done in her networks has been supportive. Okay, so now let's pivot to our conversation, the default vision. So in spite of all of this work, and much like past history where you have a top-down system, our region is being put on a path that is not where it needs to go for the health of the Mon Valley. We still have serious future visioning and leadership problems in inertia, avoidance, denial, obfuscation, mendacity, only exacerbate and accelerate the price that we continue to pay. So this is a report that was released in 2019 by the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission. This is our regional planning organization where all federal money that's allocated to our region gets directed for supporting our infrastructure. And what this group did is sneak in on page 63 of this report, this bullet that has a 19th century incandescent bulb, energy resources strategy, support the identification and development of an Appalachian storage hub for promoting the local use of locally derived ethane feedstock. So this was sneaked in at the last minute. Our groups came out and wrote letters to oppose this. I've never seen our county executive so angry when we called out why this was a bad vision to put into motion. But the county commissioners approved this and it made its way into the federal government. These are some of the things that were included in the vision for our region. And you'll see it starts with natural gas production and then building out a whole entire industrial system on top of that. Now, this wasn't gonna, wouldn't go anywhere unless it was backed up by money. And so if you look at the date of this, this was January 3rd, 2020. This was three days before the insurrection that took place in Washington, D.C. This was one of the last acts of the Trump administration. They passed this continuing resolution that funded a lot of things that were part of that vision that was in that uh, SPC plan energy storage, it, it allocated $39 billion to the Department of Energy, and that money got allocated to studying energy storage, long-term ethane production, hydrogen hubs, carbon capture and sequestration, and carbon storage were all funded by this bill. And, you know, this was even before President Biden could do anything and the new Congress could do anything. So this puts something into motion, and this has been picked up by our region's leadership. And so, you know, in this pattern of sneaking things out, this was a report that was released in April of this year called Our Energy's Future by, our region's future by, our, sorry, our region's energy future by the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. This was put out in a press release, which was basically a rally that took place at the Energy Innovation Center downtown Pittsburgh, where no one outside of this group really knew that this was happening. And they had a big press event that happened to talk about this as our new guiding plan for our region's industry. And so what is this industry, what does this vision look like? It's driven by 
greenwashing. What do I mean by that? Everyone knows that our region is at risk because of carbon emissions, given the climate crisis, that it doesn't make sense to double down on polluting industry that emits a lot of carbon. But instead of following the guidelines of the Paris Climate Accord, which calls for a two degree, um, holding the, the climate increase at two degrees centigrade, our region's leader said, we're not gonna do that. We're, we're gonna shoot for uh, something, I'm sorry, it's a, a one and a half degrees is what they are shooting for at the Paris Climate Agreement. Our region's leader said, well, two degrees is okay. And if you look at what they're talking about in terms of emissions reductions of CO2, and on that chart on the right here, I have another slide that blows it up a little bit bigger. They're essentially saying there will be no industrial reductions in CO2 by the year 2030, and then only a 50% reduction by the year 2050. In the power sector, the blue square, that is not even entirely clear how much it's going to be reduced by 2030, but their choice of 2019 as a base year is their attempt to already try to claim credit for the carbon reductions for the closure of the Cheswick power plant that happened this year. So it's not even entirely clear that the power sector has any reductions built into it over the next years, over the next 10 years or so. The other part of this vision is where's the investment money going to come from? And if you look at this chart, at the very bottom of this chart is investment in solar and wind energy. It is the lowest choice of all things that they're putting here. And the number one thing that they're doubling down on is carbon capture demonstration projects. Okay, now the problem with this is that these carbon capture and sequestration projects don't work. They, they don't capture nearly amount of carbon and they add so much fuel use that it doesn't make any sense. And this whole thing is going to need to be funded by the government. So that we'll be investing money to build out this carbon capture and sequestration hub. And guess what? In the bill that's just um, passed the U.S. Senate, this is what is built in. Is federal money for building out hydrogen hub and carbon capture and sequestration in the bill that was just passed. And so our region is set on this trajectory without any real vetting or public input. And in fact, the amount of money that's being allocated just to this is $3.2 billion. And I just wanted to point out, I was driving back from Washington County on Monday, on Tuesday, and this is a photograph from the front window of my car, which is something I'd never seen before, is hydrogen being shipped by truck on our highway. So this is dangerous and it's new and it's something that's already starting to happen apparently. This is in Washington County, right near the town of Washington, PA, where I saw that. Now the other conditions here, of course, is U.S. Steel pulling out of investing in the Mon Valley. This headline says a $1 billion upgrade. It's actually a $1.5 billion upgrade that they decided that they would not do. And so uh, we, the Brief Project, organized, the, we're a coalition. We organized a letter, an open letter to our elected government and business leaders in May of 2021. And these were the things that, that people that we work with in the Mon Valley want to see. They want to see a vision centering on improving the health of communities with leadership and reliable good faith partners that keep promises, a plan respecting residents' rights to clean air and water and a healthy environment, investments in people, not just in technology and especially not technology in industries that harm communities, solutions that address the short-term air pollution problems and long-term climate necessities lacking in past and current proposed plans for the Mon Valley, and reliable family-sustaining jobs in industries that help not hurt local communities. So, you know, where we're ending up with this part, well, there, this is a report that was just released on Monday called Misplaced Faith of the Ohio Valley Institute. 
that basically said that if you compare counties in Pennsylvania where fracking has happened and counties where fracking has not happened, <clears throat> that actually there, the counties where the natural gas counties happen are actually worse off or indistinguishable as if all of the natural gas investment over the last decade was a meaningless contribution to the economics of our state. And so this is what I think that we need. People know what they need. People in the Mon Valley know what they need. We need to have dialogue. We don't need to sneak out these reports and jam home these, these visions that only benefit a few people. And paternalistic, technological, and quote unquote business solutions should be viewed skeptically and, and uh, vetted publicly. And so with that, that kind of sets the stage for our conversation and the context. And with that, I would like to welcome to the conversation uh, a, a good friend of mine, a mentor, someone who's inspiring for so many people, Dr. Patricia DeMarco, who has been a scholar and involved with many of our region's institutions. And so thank you, Patty, for being here tonight and for inviting me to join you on a panel. Well, thank you, Matt. I know the Battle of Homestead Foundation has had a long history of trying to connect environmental problems with job creation. And I think the most succinct version of why we're doing this comes from Leo Girard, um, who said that we have to have good jobs and a clean environment because we'll need to have both or we will have neither. And I keep thinking about those words as we're looking at these kinds of boondoggle proposals again. You know, the best next best thing was going to be fracking and natural gas and making plastic. And that was going to be the bridge, the next bridge. And now they're talking about hydrogen and carbon sequestration as the next bridge. But they haven't spent any time and attention on the pillar on the other side of that bridge and building a vision of what we are moving toward. And people will not move to a vacuum, understandably. Uh, we have been in a, in a tradition for many years, almost 100 years, of this fossil extractive business model. It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work because we are up against the laws of nature. We are now reaching the thresholds of what the living ecosystems that we depend on for our life support can handle in the way of saturating the air with carbon dioxide, saturating the oceans with carbon dioxide so they become more acidic and placing this big suffocating blanket over the atmosphere that holds the heat and is actually warming the entire planet so that we have places that have never had glacial melt now not having snow on the, on the mountain caps. And this has huge implications for all of us. People say, you know, that moving to a clean economy is gonna to be too expensive. Well, you saw the graph of how much they're planning to spend on carbon capture and sequestration. If you actually know what that does, that means that when you're burning coal or gas or petroleum in a, in a boiler, you're gonna capture what comes out in the smoke and then pipe it somewhere and put it underground. So I was asking the guys at the Cheswick power plant actually, who were complaining about having to put scrubbers on and they said, well, you know, the output of the plant, if you're recapturing heat is about 34, 35%, we can get it up to 36. And then you put these scrubbers on, it goes down to about maybe 30. And now if we have to do carbon capture, it's gonna go down to 11. That means, that for the amount of fuel that you burn, only 11% of it will actually turn into electricity you can sell. So you have to burn even more, even more than you did before to get the same amount of output. The whole technology is an artist confabulation that has never been proven even at the laboratory bench model. So what I find frustrating and what Matt described very clearly is that the people who have a vested interest in continuing this business model of extractive fossil-based economy. Now we're doing natural gas from the Marcellus and Utica shale before it was coal, in between it was oil. That model is not sustainable, it is not viable. 
And the, the natural living world is giving us signals left, right, and sideways daily that we're hitting the tipping points. We need to make a U-turn in the policies that we have used to date. And the thing that makes me so frustrated is that I've been involved with the Reimagine Appalachia project now for two or three years. And when this plan of a plastics hub and a hydrogen hub came out as the future of the Ohio River Valley, when things were just beginning to peak before they started to slide off um, in about 2011, 2012, people started thinking about that isn't the fate we want for the Ohio River Valley. That isn't the fate we want in our communities. And the League of Women Voters has done reimagined community leadership programs all across the state. I mean, we've participated in them in, you know, Erie and Meadville and Lehigh Valley. And we went to Wheeling, West Virginia, and people came from Ohio and Kentucky and Pennsylvania. And we started to say, you know, we have wonderful assets that have made Pittsburgh and the Ohio River Valley, the center of manufacturing that it has been. And those natural capital assets are still with us. We have the geography, we have the connectivity with the rivers, we have the mountains, we have resources here, and we have a skilled and committed workforce, a very diverse skilled and committed workforce. These assets are transferable into the new clean economy for the next generation. And it's here already today. We don't have to wait for some silver bullet or proving out some technology that hasn't even been documented to work yet. We don't have to rely on things for which we don't have solutions. We have the possibility now with the passage of the um, in Jobs and Infrastructure Act and with the Inflation Reduction Act, we have actually made some commitments to moving into the clean economy. So the kinds of job possibilities that we have in the clean economy that could actually happen in the Mon Valley right here, things like modernizing the electric grid would create 142,999 jobs in Pennsylvania. And it would take a $3.2 billion investment from federal um, sources. It would leverage about $18 billion of private investment because when you have federal dollars and match and make that kind of a commitment, you can get a 21.2 billion addition to the economy for modernizing the electric grid. Um, another area that, uh, and this was included in the legislation that has passed. So this is actually gonna happen. Um, you also have the area of actually recognizing that we need to repair the damage to the land. A lot of the people, and we started the Reimagine Appalachia process by listening to people. We had listening sessions all across all four states and listened to what people wanted and, and aspired to. And they said, you know, we need to heal the land. They take things away, they mine, they extract, and they walk away. They put big industrial complexes here, the business goes bankrupt, and they walk away, and the taxpayers are left with the mess. So they put money into these bills for repairing the damage, repairing abandoned mine lands, repairing and plugging abandoned wells. And that creates a lot of jobs. It creates 9,283 jobs just in Pennsylvania. And that kind of thing can make a big difference to communities. So I'm not gonna blather on forever, but what I wanna, what I wanna really point out is that we know what can happen if we invest in our own communities, if we put a focus on improving the quality of life of people, making the air better, making the water safe and more abundant and accessible, improving public transportation and making sure there are parks and, and trees in the streets, you can increase the sense of well-being of a community. You can make it attractive for people to be there. When residents want to be there, businesses want to be there. People do not want to live in a place that has been ignored, disinvested, and allowed to fall into decay. And a lot of times, company towns have been abandoned and left to fend for themselves. 
and we have not put money into the communities. I'm a local official and I'm not gonna tell you what we go through to get a grant. We don't have a staff of hundreds. You have to come up with a match and for federal grants, it can be as much as 20 to 50%. And if you're doing a big investment project, electric vehicle infrastructure, new roads, public transit, the money isn't there unless you get help from the government and put taxpayers' money into communities where people live instead of into boondoggle things that have never been proven that just enrich a few companies up at the top. So Matt, what do you think it's gonna to take to shift what people actually want away from what has happened in the planning process where behind closed doors in Dick Cheney's smoke-filled back room where the National Energy Act of 2005 created an exemption from seven federal environmental and worker protection laws or else fracking would be illegal. Now they've built this whole construct on something that's based on an illegal foundation. The people don't want this. The people want to stop it. So how can we make that U-turn? What will it take to have that happen? Thanks. Well, that's, I mean, that's a big question. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think we're seeing it happen, but it takes an enormous amount of engagement and energy to make it happen. So for example, Patty, yes. you know, you were part of how our county council just recently banned fracking in our parks. Now, oh. you know, if, if somebody who comes from outside of this region and saw the parks that we have in our county, our urban county, and how beautiful and how lucky we are, fortunate we are to have them. And the fact that anyone would consider using them for natural resource purposes, you know, and threatening the water there and so on, they would think these people are missing something that's really vital to them. Um, but because of the way special interests influenced our county executive and early count, earlier county council members, they allowed that fracking to happen in Deer Lakes Park. But, you know, organizing, persistence, getting elected officials in place who are aligned with the values that people want to see, it takes an enormous amount of effort. But the reality is, our country is a 220, almost 250 year experiment in self-governance. That what's key to this is that it's our government, mm -hmm. it's our community, it's our water, it's our air. It belongs to all of us. All of it belongs to all of us. So we have to take the initiative and responsibility to advocate for those values that mean something for us rather than what's happened over the last 50 years, I think, is people have allowed themselves to be demobilized. It's because they're busy. People are raising their families or just trying to make ends meet. But if enough of us who pool our resources together and have conversations like this, we can hold our government accountable. We can choose leaders that have the values that we want to see move forward. And it also begins with models that are the, the right solution, the, yeah. the versions of things that we want to see more of. Yeah. So for example, it's entirely possible. I showed you that slide of that textile manufacturing um, that I, it was a photograph I took in 1996. I was working on a project that's in the, the upper Ruhr Valley of Switzerland where they made textiles for 400 years and that industry in the late 90s was being decimated mm -hmm. by competition because it was being undersold and the labor costs were high and the materials costs were high in Switzerland. And that mill was gonna close. It was 35 people that worked there. But this project came together where they got creative engineer, creative business person, designers, people who knew stuff about ecology, and they redesigned a textile product and went through their whole supply chain so that they could produce it. So that what was being made would not introduce plastic in the environment, would not have toxic dyes that have endocrine disrupting chemicals in them and was still beautiful and 
could sell at a price point that could sustain all of that. And that actually won an award for an international textile show. And that's, that really launched Green Textiles Worldwide, that, um, that project. It's one, one of the reasons why I was fascinated by it because of the parallels that exist yeah. with our own experience of having an industry which is a low margin, high volume commodity based business be dismantled slowly over time because of the lack of investment and the markets are shifting for it. Yes. So it can be done if it's done in a smart way where we come together and build the networks and invest in the things that support that type of infrastructure. We do have the knowledge base here locally for it. We do have a workforce here that knows how to do things in a very skillful way. And so that's what we want to see more of. We can't let an organization, you know, the Allegheny Conference for Community Development was launched in the 1940s because of air pollution problems right. <laughs> and water pollution problems. Right. And they that's when civic leaders decided that those things needed to be solved and they worked on them. Um, well, you know, we've lost our way. That group has lost its way and it needs to be in touch with these sorts of things so that we can get back to going in the right direction. Sorry, well, Patty, go ahead. That's OK. It seems to you know, I, I know this is this is something that um, if you polled the population, they would not elect to go in the direction of yet another highly polluting, highly capital intensive at the public expense kind of an industry. Um, but there are in the, in the new legislation that hopefully the house will pass on tomorrow um, that they will invest in industrial transformations so that we can actually clean up some of the businesses that we already have and also invest in businesses that rely on manufacturing. Now, one of the things that I have found fascinating as an asset for our own area is that we have 20 um, business and technology incubators in the greater Pittsburgh area. And I have a link to where they are that you know we can put in the chat later. But if you look at about the 125 or so new businesses that spin out of those incubators after they're in there only for five years and they have to move out, most of them do not locate in the Pittsburgh area. I really think we should put a directed effort into capturing what it is that those companies that we have created here with the intellectual capital of our universities and connect them to the very diverse and robust skill base of the workers that are here so that they can stay here. I know there are plenty of places in our area where we can locate new businesses for development. If those places are attractive to these businesses that are emerging, they want places where they can take public transportation or bicycle. They want to have treed avenues to walk or ride under. They want to have park amenities that are in every neighborhood, not that you drive miles to get to. They want to have air that doesn't make them have asthma, and they want to have to not worry about the water and the paint on their buildings. We need to invest in our communities, in our community infrastructure to improve the av average everyday quality of life. And then we will have something to market to keep these businesses here instead of having them go off somewhere where they think they're gonna be better off. I can't imagine anybody these days moving to a place like Texas. If you look at the climate trajectory in some of the places that are considered hot spots for growth, well, they're gonna be hot spots, all right. They've had record droughts for five years in a row in some of these high-tech guru places. Well, the air conditioning only gets you so far and increases the environmental justice inequity. Uh, we're going to be in a place with any luck that will have a relatively moderate climate if we can get ahead of the curve and not poison everything for people going forward. Another area which I think we really could be productive is, you know, we don't really market our own capabilities, even to ourselves, never mind to other businesses. Um, earlier this year, the Battle of Homestead Foundation had a speaker from the international, um, the IBEW International out of um, uh, Seattle. 
And he talked about the fact that their union organized a marketing campaign to attract their next employer. We could do that. We have wonderful workforce here. We have wonderful union leadership here. They tend to just fall in line and follow the carrot that's put out there by the Allegheny Conference and others. When did they get to have the last word on what we do next? They're not the majority of the taxpayers. And I used to go to the Duquesne Club business meetings, breakfasts that they had, you know, and I was always the outlier from, you know, Chatham University asking the rude questions. And one of the things I asked was when the marketing director for Shell was there while they were trying to land the project and soliciting the $6 billion subsidy that they got to put that plant there. I said to her, well, you're putting up a brand new plant. Um, surely you'll be using green chemistry principles for your production design. And she said, I don't even know what you're talking about. She said, talk to our, you know, they, she sent me off to some tech guy. They did not even get the concept. So when we need to look at is making a new manufacturing base that goes away from the raw material to trash model and moves into the minimum raw material, recapture, reuse, repurpose, circular materials economy, which you did your research on in your thesis. So I think we're both of us way ahead of our time and have been screeching for years, but now I think it's time to mobilize the, art, the army. And um, I would like to open the floor to questions from our audience and see if we can engage some other ideas in here. Do you think we're on the right path to be resisting the mainstream investors? And do you think we have a good story to tell for a green economy in Pittsburgh? And what are, the, what are our best allies to show up in force like we did for getting the county parks blocked from fracking? We had hundreds and hundreds of people. We had a lot of them at Deer Park when we tried to stop it the first time, but we got rolled over by the industry, you know, promises, none of which have come true, all of which have been violated. And Dr. Schultz, Dr. Stoltz documented with data before, during, and after the drilling that the water was being harmed, not only in the park, but in the whole watershed that fed that community. And so we had the data and the evidence to say, enough, stop. And I think that's true for this continuing to use fracked gas to build out the next big best thing when we have the solutions right in front of us. So I would like to um, hope that we can have a dialogue and go forward to look at how we can create more investment in our own communities to do things that will improve the situation for everybody here. Well, Patty, we do have several questions that have come in from the chat. I'd like to start with one from Kathy, and Kathy, I'm not going to slaughter your last name, um, but she specifically said since city, I mean, sorry, County Executive Fitzgerald is in its final term, who can we expect to rise to the County Executive Office, and what can we do to elect a more human and environmentally friendly executive? Well, um, well, I'll start maybe. And so what, one of the things is, first of all, awareness. So in, in our county, we tend to be dominated by one party. And that means the primary election in many ways becomes the main election. That's actually May of 2023. Mm -hmm. So starting in January of this year, maybe even in the fall, People need to think about who should be leading us next. And that means, you know, thinking up key questions, maybe organizing community meetings and inviting candidates to speak at forums. You know, the League of Women Voters has done a good job of hosting candidate forums in the past. So have other institutions and getting these, these, what I would call economic development, quality of life questions front and center for the next set of candidates and not allow people to just give mealy mouthed answers 
and greenwashed answer. So one of the things that our current county executive does is any time that we criticize the natural gas, he says things like, well, let's look at our airport. We've got a solar array there and fracking that's happening, and both of those things have, are what make us successful. The reality is the solar array contributes this much energy, and it's not even really connected to the airport. It just goes to the grid. And the fracking part contributes this much. And, you know, it's like it's greenwash. So people need to know that that's not how this should be structured, that there should be fundamentally investment questions in the community foregrounded when the candidates are vetted or selected. Also knowing that that person appoints many people to many of the boards around the county. So it's not just that one person, but asking that person, who are you gonna appoint to be the next board of health director and who's gonna sit on the county board of health that's responsible for our air quality? Mm -hmm. Those would, are the sorts of questions we need to work on now. I would say the other thing that would be important in this process is to hold up the examples of things that are working and seek people that will promote those. Um, trying to get better connectivity through public transit, making sure that we have communities that are have safe bus stops and safe you know, they say, well, there's no ridership on this. There's no point expanding the bus service. But people are expected to stand in poison ivy patches without any space to get off the road at a bus stop. They're not going to go there. There's no safe way to get to the bus stop and be there. So being, you know, diligent about showing what it takes to have success. And the solar story, every time Mr. Fitzgerald brings it up, I just have steam coming out of my ears because, as Matt said, Theirs is basically for decoration. Our borough building has enough solar on the roof that it makes more energy than the building uses on an average annual basis. And we're now looking at putting solar on two or three more buildings as soon as we can figure out how to finance it. So doing you know, the issues that work and put people to work, they have put a new weatherization assistance legislation in the state of Pennsylvania that will create a lot of jobs. All right, who's going to organize getting that grant money out of the federal government through the state government into the communities where it's needed? That can happen much more expeditiously if the county is engaged in doing it instead of making sure that all the frackers get the most money they can because they don't give very much back. One of the things the Reimagine Appalachia Blueprint uh, required was a community benefits package to be attached to all federal dollars. That did make it into the reconciliation bill. So it's one of the things that really has to be attended to when you have new leadership elected is that they have to be held accountable. Just as a follow-up to that, are there organizations among the several environmental organizations in the area, are any of them in the business of uh, putting up candidates and organizing to elect candidates specifically on climate issues? Yeah, I mean, there are several that do that. You know, there's Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania, which is statewide. Then, you know, regional, and we also have Penn Environment and Clean Water Action that do exactly those same things. So they are vetting candidates um, and we'll expect to see a lot more of that going forward. Um, so yes, I think um, the, the, the key thing to think about here, this is where this is a little bit different, is that most people approach the environment from the perspective of it being a constraint on what you can do. And what I think Patty is talking about is actually seeing the environment as a source of innovation that actually makes everything better because it's baked in as a primary goal in the first place. And that, that means that you're not wasting resources. It means that energy is very efficiently used and distributed. The materials don't present long-term problems that require cleanup or disposal or management in dumps and things. 
Um, the products themselves are not things that last only a few minutes and then they end up in a landfill. You know, it's being smarter about all of those things. And actually, that means we're investing in a much smarter way. I just say one, add one more thing, Patty, and that is today a new study came out that showed that Pittsburgh is ranked last in terms of housing quality in the country. That one in 11 houses in Pittsburgh has problems with its foundation, whether it's got a crack foundation or subsidence or leaks or mold. Um, and it's because we have a very old housing stock. You know, this is happening at a time when our next county executive will be looking at reassessing property taxes. Mm -hmm. So these are two things that can be linked in a creative solution that can improve the health of everyone in the county because if we're eliminating mold and leaks and things that reduces respiratory problems world uh, um, uh, population wide and it improves the value of property and it means that when the property is assessed its value actually is increased. increasing and the investment happens within the community right so all of those things can be done in a smart way um, and it's an opportunity for us yep and i think that's that's the key thing is that we have to look at things that invest in our communities i mean the buck stops at your local government and our capabilities to address problems locally are diminishing and diminishing because they take you know priority to give these glamour projects that don't really put anything back into the community themselves unless you force a company to do that they'll give the minimum the five percent that they have to give for charity for tax deduction purposes but they don't really care about what happens in our neighborhoods so well speaking of sexy sound bites and the like. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the hydrogen hub and how it's being promoted versus what you see as the real issues? Okay, there are two things that I find problematic with the hydrogen hub. First of all, it depends on fracked gas. And we already are doing a thousand wells a year to support one shell petrochemical plant it will be three or four times that to support what they're talking about for a hydrogen hub. And it is very energy intensive. It is very expensive. And that is gonna be borne by the federal government on our taxpayers. The carbon capture and sequestration is the parallel to it because they have to draw down the carbon that they're gonna end up generating. When you take methane and take off the hydrogen, you're gonna end up with carbon dioxide. Methane is one carbon and four hydrogens. You don't get, you don't have carbon-free hydrogen from fracked gas. You have all of the problems of fracking plus all of the problems of creating more CO2, but then they've decided they're gonna sequester that CO2 by pumping it underground somewhere. It doesn't stay where you put it. Neither do the fracking solutions stay where you put them. When you put something 13,000 times more concentrated than seawater underground, it doesn't stay where you put it. It will migrate by capillary action through the rock. We are putting a ticking bomb of 20 to 30 years duration underground for our next generation to, you know, cover the, you know, be boring, bearing the cost. And if you think about it, in the ancient times, when the Romans conquered an enemy, they salted the fields so that nothing would grow. We are salting the groundwater of our next and the next after generation. It is unconscionable and completely wrong to go continuing. And it's a lost opportunity cost because the money that you invest into this very expensive, unproven technology could be going into things that we know work, like passive solar design houses and wind, wind systems and battery systems that are not based on lithium, but are, you know, earth, earth systems or acid water-based systems, things that can be propagated and that are not real expensive, that you can build into microgrids that would make our buildings more viable, make our grid more resilient, and make more people able to participate in a shared prosperity. Sometimes I think that's the part that these guys don't like, 
is that it would be a shared prosperity that reaches more people and that would improve all of our communities, not just the top one or two percent. And and I, I see Larry put in the chat um, yeah. a point I was going to make that we don't need to do a Rube Goldberg process starting with frac gas and ending up with hydrogen. When renewable power already meets the needs that we have within the existing financial system without requiring subsidies, it's already out competing with these systems. So yep. why would you do this? The only reason why you would do this is because the people who have invested in this don't want to stop doing it. And they want to maintain their interest at the expense of other people. There's not a good economic basis to continue doing this. There's not a good moral basis to continue doing that. We, we already have the solutions that the market has selected. It just takes some time to convert it. And we need some time and we don't need to be putting these barriers in place to stop that from happening. Right. And if we wanted to, just like what happened, you know, I mentioned about some bad things in the bill that just passed. There's some really good things, really, really good things in this bill mm -hmm. that passed too, that can accelerate some of these things that we need to see happening, um, like green power, you know, heat pumps, um, uh, I think. Well, transportation. Yeah, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, I think, just passed the law that allows there to um, not require hookups for natural gas, like it's local communities are allowed to ban requiring hookups for fossil fuels for new houses that are constructed. You know, there are states that are already doing some of these things. Yep. Yep. We need to be doing more of that. The, one of the most exciting things I find in this Inflation Reduction Act is the natural infrastructure. It will create 600,000 good jobs. And what this does is real carbon capture and sequestration. It protects forests, wetlands, natural ecosystems to shield communities from climate impact. But it includes, you know, coastal communities to restore um, um, storm and fishery related damages, establishing forests. And we have a lot of people in our community who plant um, blueberry bushes and other kinds of native plants. This would provide funds for that kind of thing. Improving our national parks and replanting uh, to restore public lands and healthy soil, 380,000 jobs from investment to support farmers who are, re are converting to regenerative practices. This is one of the pieces of the Reimagine Appalachia blueprint that made it into the law, 380,000 jobs. And that is real carbon sequestration into the living soil, into living trees and plants that captures carbon for sure and sequesters it in a way that does not harm the environment, that doesn't create a lot of side effects that are not beneficial. So I don't think we have a paucity of solutions. I think what we have is a lack of recognition that the laws of nature are not negotiable, that we are up against the limits of what the natural ecosystems can absorb without changing our life conditions tremendously in ways that will not be beneficial to people. And if we can recognize that and make that policy you turn in our laws, which we control, and begin to invest in things that preserve our life support system and make the life and quality of life of people in communities better, the business model will follow. You don't get businesses locating in places that look like you know, a bombed out, abandoned community. People want to come to places where it's beautiful and safe and healthy to live. And we can do that. We have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, along those lines, we have a question from Hillary Lewis who asked, do you see any role for green hydrogen in the Mon Valley's future, for example, in steel making? Okay, green so, hydrogen and blue hydrogen are different. Please and, explain. Yes, green hydrogen is when you use a renewable resources like solar or wind, and make electrolysis of water that separates hydrogen and oxygen. 
It has the benefit of releasing oxygen into the atmosphere, which is a good thing. And it captures hydrogen in a way that can be compressed and used as a storage. So when you're making, like our building makes more energy than we use at peak times in the summertime when the sun is shining. If we have every building doing that, you could be making hydrogen at noon on a bright sunny day and storing that and then using it to make energy in the middle of the night when the sun isn't shining and it's all renewable energy. You can also use anaerobic digestion of municipal waste. This is done frequently in places like Germany where they, instead of doing um, aerobic waste treatment like we do here, they make it in an anaerobic situation where they encapture it and it makes methane instead of releasing fumes into the air. And you can capture that and make um, what it's called, they call it green hydrogen because it's from the contemporaneous, not the fossil uh, hydro, uh, carbon cycle. Yeah, I guess what I would add to that, um, to Hillary's question, is it's an important question. So steel making, I think, is responsible for about 7% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions and is a very energy intensive process. And the, the process of steel making to date has been heavily relying upon carbon because carbon reduction is what has been used to drive out impurities from iron to make steel. It, many of you know this even better than I do because you worked <laughs> in the steel industry. So, um, but what where things are headed now is to shift the whole steel industry away from carbon intensity. One tier of that involves just focusing on the recycle because there's a lot of scrap steel. Shifting away from blast furnaces and using electric arc furnaces for for the scrap steel market. And that can be powered by renewables. So scaling up renewable power for <laughs> with battery storage so that that can happen. Now that doesn't that doesn't mean doesn't help create new steel. Um, and so you, you have to part of the problems there is you have to through the blast furnace process get higher quality iron. Um, that doesn't work so well um, with just the the electric arc process. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are some combination processes there. Uh, there's one out of a, a, an outfit in, um, in Boston called Boston Metals that, you know, requires a little bit higher quality iron ore as an input, but it doesn't require the use of carbon at all or hydrogen. It just uses, you know, an electrolysis process to create steel. So that's another niche opportunity for our region. And then if you are going to be, you know, taking less quality iron as a primary input, that is where hydrogen can play a role. It can, it, there's a couple of different processes that are set up for that. And of course, we would only want to have green hydrogen for that. The way Patty's described it, there's no reason for us to want to use reformed methane for our hydrogen. We, we would want to use green hydrogen uh, because that is what will do the most to decarbonize the industry. All of those things are things that our region could do. Mm -hmm. If it, it, are the, it really is a leadership issue. And if we could steer US Steel to adopting those things, mm -hmm. then we would, and, and they know, it's not like they don't know about this. They are at the table of, international steel tables where they're looking at decarbonization. They haven't committed to this. They have bought the electric arc furnaces in Arkansas, not in our region. But if they want to continue doing primary steel making, they should invest in maybe even some of these subsidies can be brought forward to build a green hydrogen based reduction process um, for steel making in our valley. So that's what we want. We, but we don't need is to continue to be attached to natural gas and all of the other ancillary things that go along with it. The problem is once you commit to blue hydrogen, you commit to a whole spectrum of use of natural gas after that. That mm -hmm. is a whole refining process that, that connects everything to plastic production as well as 
all sorts of other chemical processes that our region really doesn't need to double down on. So we should just leapfrog over that and go to the right solution uh, for if, if, if we want to commit to steel making in our valley, in our Mon Valley, which, you know, our legacy suggests that that is a, a superpower that we would want to continue, but not in a lagging sort of way. Right now, they're putting bandages on these plants that are so old that leak, that continue to generate air quality problems and just run them into the ground. And that's not a strategy that we want to see going forward. That, that is no leadership, no vision, laziness, and at the expense of all of us. So when you refer to convincing U.S. Steel to do these things, how does one do that? What, what sort of vision do you have for that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it is, we, we, we call them out all the time. <laughs> you know, we, we, we do on social media, we, with our press releases, when we, there are public comment processes, they know what we're saying and asking for. You know, yeah. it's, we I need think, more people to be doing right. it. And we need more people, people we need more voices, and yeah. we also need the workers to get involved in asking for a better future. And I think a lot of times we have been complacent in saying, well, the unions take care of themselves. They know what they want. But a lot of times they've been bludgeoned into following along because they are threatened with losing their jobs. And I think what we need to make sure people understand is that there are good jobs in the clean economy that use the same skills that they're using now, but applied in a different way. And uh, I don't know, um, I'm looking at the time here. I do have a couple of pictures of what those look like. If you want to um, move to that at this point, Suzanne, maybe. Okay. And um, I just a few to show you that, you know, some of the myths that we've been told about jobs in the clean economy not paying well and not being good quality jobs um, that are just myths perpetrated by people who are trying to suppress the options that we truly have. So could you share the slides up for me, please? Yes. Thank you. As soon as I find them, I will do that. Oh no, they should be. No, no, they're here. Don't worry. No worries. <laughs> they were here a little bit ago. <laughs> yes. Um, while I'm doing that, I did have one one follow-up from the um question before, which is What's the role of local news or lack of in informing and educating people on these issues? What are the media sites or sources that report on local efforts that can amplify the work of some of the organizations mentioned? And how can people learn about and connect with groups and individuals interested in these issues? Well, I'll let you take that one, Matt, because I'm not involved. Well, what, in, in some ways, so... It's, it's, a, it's a mixed picture here. In some ways, we're very fortunate because we do have local foundations that support public radio, public news, you know, programs like the Allegheny Front um, and, and, you know, public source, um, independent media that do cover these things. Um, it's just they, we need more people to know about those outlets and follow them and use them. Um, because they are, there is thoughtful coverage. Now, as far as mass media goes, you know, our television stations and so on, you know, the same folks that sit at the Allegheny Conference are the same folks that talk to the editors of these media programs. And, you know, the Sunday business page or our region's business never covers these things. They did, they did up to 2011, 2012, and they stopped doing it. And instead they're doubling down on the messages related to oil and gas and pet cam and so on. So that's the challenge that we face is the leadership that's bought into this vision that we don't want, they've doubled down on it. It's our job through forums like this social media, talking to independent media, you know, inside climate news, it's, that's a good source to follow. They cover these stories. Um, the environmental health news, 
very good journalism about the health issues associated with some of these technologies. So the information is out there. It's getting it in front of people and getting people mobilized is our challenge. Okay. Patty? Thank you. Okay, you can go to the next slide. I just wanted to say that we are looking at um, how work is in the clean economy. And you need to know that you have, if you just look at the energy sector alone, um, you have really three parts of the energy economy. One is production, one is in energy efficiency, and one is in energy management. I'm going to give you an idea of what kind of the skills are in each of those areas. But first, I want to show you the wages level. Could you show the next slide? So you have here in all three of these energy sectors, the average wages are above the uh, national average of 2386 per hour for these kinds of industries. Clean energy production tends to be the highest in uh, 28.41 an hour. Energy efficiency, 25. Energy management, 27. These are not low paying jobs. These are good quality, good paying jobs. And next slide. Many of them are also union jobs. Um, if you're in clean energy production, you need electricians, electrician helpers, installers, repairers for solar systems. They include nuclear power plant operators and electric power plant operators. Electric grid people are going to need a lot of those. Energy efficiency, all of these skills are good union jobs. Roofers, roofers, helpers, pipe layers, plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, HVAC mechanics, HVAC installers. If you're inserting geothermal earth tube systems, you need the same skills that you need to drill for gas. Drilling, knowing the hydrology, knowing about how to put piping underground, knowing how to connect and flow. All of these things are good union jobs, good union paying jobs. Next slide. Environmental management, this has all of the management levels of things, hazardous waste, refuse recycling. This also goes into the circular economy management, septic system engineers, plant and system operators, conservation scientists. And there are many, many more. If you include recovery of abandoned mine lands and regenerative agriculture, what we really have here is a need to recognize that we are at a new opportunity area. We're at the dawn of a new age, a finer future, a better future. But we have to seize that. We have to use what we know, organize and fight for what we want. Don't stand by complacently and get rolled over by people who are working only for the vested interests. Next slide. So this is a call to action really to all of us. Climate change is going to happen because of the result of human, human actions, and our laws have to change to enable and promote the green jobs economy instead of protecting the fossil industries. We're looking backward to a world that no longer exists. Last slide. So the next steps that I see out of this process and this conversation would be to document and promote the skills of our Mon Valley labor force in the shape of how they fit into the new economy, into the green economy. And then survey all the companies that are coming out of the 20 business incubators in Pittsburgh. Let them know that we're here. Help them find places and niches in the communities that need jobs and that need and would welcome a new business. And market the Mon Valley as still an excellent center for manufacturing, innovation, and quality of life. All of the natural capital that made it a manufacturing center from olden days are still here. And then reach out and educate about the hazards of going to yet another fossil extractive based industry. That business model does not work. Fossil hydrogen and CCS is an expensive dead end. We should call it out as such, document how the past hasn't worked and go forward on a new, a new brighter vision for a better future. Thank you, that was amazing from both of you really. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I think we're gonna have to turn it over to John now to take us home, but thank you both so much. It's an incredible amount of information and we're really grateful to you for bringing it to us. John? 
uh, Patty and Matt, it was a very meaningful presentation. I love how holistically we discuss what we have to do uh, and understand that it's not just a, a silo of activity, but it's a whole way of understanding and changing our society. And that's really what a, a revolutionary uh, uh, call is about. It's, it's, it's about understanding how, how change can be made and uh, having the courage to try to make that change. And uh, really appreciate your analysis and discussion. And um, it's a commitment that we all have to make because really our future is dependent upon it. So um, thank you, Matt and, and Patty and uh, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Suzanne, our program chair mm -hmm. and Larry McCullough, our communications manager for helping out I want to encourage uh, those who are watching tonight, um, come join us if you can. Uh, if you do, you'll receive a card that'll give you free admission to you and a party of four to the Heinz History Center and the Western Pennsylvania Sports Museum, the Fort Pitt Museum, and the Metacroft Rock Shelter and Historic Village. Mm. Our, our annual dues are $20, $10 for students and retirees. Of course, if you can, we appreciate contributions above that um, because we're pretty much an all volunteer organization. And we understand too, that we need to develop our organizational capacities so that this wonderful, frankly, the wonderful resources of the educational programs that we can offer um, can be made available um, uh, by other ways to those that wish to see them and to learn. So um, go to our website and um, consider a tax deductible contribution. Uh, it's battleofhomestead.org. I'm sure it's appeared in the chat tonight, battleofhomestead.org to learn more. And let me invite you to some exciting upcoming activities. The entertainment year uh, is almost over, but Saturday, September 17th at 8 p.m., Battle of Homestead will be sponsoring together with Calliope uh, a live in-person stage performance of a play called Mother Jones in Heaven, uh, starring Vivian Nesbitt and written by Cy Khan. Uh, this will be in the Henry Heyman Theater on Pitt campus. Uh, this is a ticketed event. You can get them uh, at uh, through the registration at uh, through Eventbrite. That'd be twenty-five dollars, and uh, because we have significant expenses in providing this production, uh, we know you'll enjoy it. It's received um, wonderful uh, recommendations and reception in other cities. On Thursday, October the twentieth. At 7.30 p.m., there will be a Battle of Homestead Zoom discussion again entitled Fascism in America, Can It Happen Here? Uh, this will be presented by Dr. Joe White and organizer Chuck Panaccio, and um, it should be on everyone's mind. And I hope that you will find it um, a meaningful discussion as we've had tonight. Uh, our final event for the year uh, is Wednesday, November 16th at 7.30 p.m. It's a Zoom film talk on a movie called 1196, A Steelworker Strike. Uh, it was a real strike that happened in Brackenridge. The filmmaker is Sam George. And there was a steelworker strike last year, 2021, a difficult and long strike. And the employer uh, was Allegheny Technologies, ATI. Interestingly, uh, when the strike was finally settled, uh, ATI announced that they were probably going to move their national headquarters to Texas. And I thought of that as Matt was talking. Mm -hmm. One way I want to say goodbye, but I know that that could be the beginning as well of uh, further uh, disinvestment from our region. So I I'm, I'm, want to take that into concern as well. If you see this film, you will be quite moved uh, by the everyday considerations that working people have to undergo 
when they decide their only alternative is to strike. And I know that you will be quite impressed with this movie. It's a very good documentary. So um, with those announcements, I want to thank all of you that um, have attended tonight and uh, invite you to uh, send your comments. There was a question on the chat. I think it was answered, but uh, the um, meeting is recorded for educational purposes to create a resource, uh, a frankly, a treasury of resources that will be available for future education. And um, you can see this, this uh, uh, recording. Uh, it will be posted on the Battle of Homestead YouTube channel. And often we can get it up uh, as soon as a week or so um, after the event. So it will be available to the public for free to see on our website. Uh, that being said, I wish everyone a, a safe and happy uh, rest of the evening and week. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, Labor Day and the celebration of labor. And uh, we hope all of you as well uh, uh, will enjoy that holiday too. Uh, take care. Uh, let's stand in solidarity and let's build the kind of coalitions that are going to make real change. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming to the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Good night.